everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Prof. Wancho Balatibat of the Department of uh, Forest Biological Science and also a curator of the forest insects of the uh, UPLB Museum of Natural History. So I will be your uh, MC today. Good morning and a pleasant day. So thank you for uh, taking time to join us today for the uh, uh, MNH Quincentennial Commemorations Webinar Series. This is the uh, sixth of the uh, uh, webinar series. Uh, Balik Tanaw, Kasaysayan at Kalikasan with the topic micro Microbiology in Philippine Cuisine, Then and Now. So to start our uh, session today, let us all uh, welcome our uh, director, Dr. Marian uh, P. De Leon, who will be giving her welcome remarks. Dr. Uh, Marian De Leon. Good morning to everyone. Welcome to the UPLB Museum of Natural History's Queen Centennial Commemoration 10-part webinar series. The UPLB MNH, Ang Pilipinas sa Loob ng Limang Siklo, features online webinar series and virtual exhibit focusing on a theme, Balik Tanaw, Kasaysayan, at Kalikasan. The 10-part webinar series will give us the chronicles and highlights in Philippine natural history for the past 500 years and the gaps and opportunities for research on the diverse Philippine flora, fauna, and microorganisms. Last July 14, we had our fifth webinar given by MNH Curator on Zoological and Wildlife, Dr. Emmanuel Ryan de Chavez, entitled Silip sa Kagahapon, Moluscan Research and Collections from the pa Spanish Period to Present. Dr. Ryan gave us a comprehensive historical account of important discoveries and explorations on Moluscan researches in the Philippines and areas of interest for future research. If you have missed Dr. De Chavez's presentation, you can still watch them by visiting the MNH YouTube channel. Today's webinar is the sixth leg of the 10-part series. The presentation to be given by Dr. Noel G. Sabino is very close to my heart. Dr. Sabino, who is an esteemed curator of the UPLB MNH Microbial Culture Collection, will focus on microbiology in Philippine cuisine then and now. On behalf of the UPLB Museum of Natural History, we would like to dedicate the sixth webinar in honor and celebration of the life of Dr. Priscilla Chinte Sanchez and her contributions in Philippine food microbiology. Dr. Priscilla C. Sanchez served as MNH curator for microbial culture collections from 1987 until her retirement in 2000. Our moderator and MNH curator on mycological herbarium, Dr. Nelson Pampulina, will further introduce our speaker. On behalf of the MNH Local Organizing Committee Chair, Mr. Florante Cruz, and Co-Chair, Mr. Alvin Fajardo, and the MNH curators and staff, allow me to thank you for your active participation in our QCC webinars. And we look forward to having you all in the next four more presentations by our experts. Thank you very much and have a blessed day to all. Thank you very much, uh, Mama uh, Marianne. And uh, I'm now giving uh, the floor to the moderator for uh, the, uh, this day's uh, seminar, Dr. Uh, Nelson M. Pampulina, who is also a curator for uh, forest uh, fungi and endomycorrhiza of the UPLB Museum of Natural History. Dr. Uh, Nelson Pampulina, it's your floor. Thank you, uh, Sir uh, JV. Good morning. Before I introduce our speaker guests, speaker today, I would like to remind you of the house rules. First, make sure that your audio is on mute and uh, your video is turned off. 
practice good webinar etiquette. And second, please use the Zoom webinar Q&A feature to send questions. For those who are watching on our on your uh, TV stream or YouTube stream, just put your questions in the comments area and our technical assistants will copy your questions to the Zoom Q&A. All right? I now have the pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Noel G. Sabino. Dr. Sabino is the MNH curator for bacteria, yeast, and molds. He is currently an associate professor seven at the Microbiology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, UPLB. Sir Noel obtained his PhD in Environmental Science, minor in Microbiology in 2016. He received his MS Microbiology minor in Soil Science in 1995 and BS Biology major in Microbiology, cum laude, in 1988 from UPLB. He specializes in microbiology, soil science, and microbial ecology, while his research interests are in honeybees, lactic acid bacteria, bacterial diversity in bees, bee pathology, bee products, and propols. He is a member of the following organizations, the Philippine Society for Microbiology Incorporated, the Gamma Sigma Delta, the Honor Society for Agriculture, Mycological Society of the Philippines Incorporated, Philippine Network of Microbial Culture Collections, Associations of uh, Systematic Biology of the Philippines, the Philippine Society for Lactic Acid Bacteria, Beekeepers Network Foundation Philippines, and the Philippine Psychological Society, including the Biology Teachers Associations. The doc Dr. Savino received the prestigious Professor William L. Fernandez Award for Excellence in Teaching Microbiology, awarded by the Philippine Society for Microbiology uh, Incorporated. In 2014, he was a sir, he was all us in 2014. He was also certified as a specialist microbiologist by the Philippine Academy of Microbiology in 2000. Friends, I now give the floor to all of you to Dr. Noel Sabino. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pampulina, for the kind introduction. And a uh, pleasant morning to all of us. Now, I would like to start my talk by asking you a simple question. Okay, so thank you for waiting and my apologies. Okay, now as mentioned, I will start my presentation by so showing you some pictures. Okay, so we have here Nata de Coco, and I think you're familiar with Nata de Coco. Then, of course, we have our patis, the famous condiment. Now, we also have queso puti, okay? Now, kao, and of course, magoong. Now, the question is, which item is not part of the group, okay? So which of these five items, which are considered staple in Philippine cuisine, is not considered as part of the group? Okay. So definitely, it will be kaong. So kaong is not considered as part of the group because okay, nata di coco, patis, kesong puti, as well as bagoong are all fermented foods. That is, they were prepared through the action of the microorganisms. Now, in the case of kaong, even though we taste uh, sour, okay, it is not a fermented product. Okay, but all of these are indeed a staple in Philippine cuisine. Now, for today, please allow me to discuss more about the so-called foods which are processed or produced through the action of microorganisms. So for today, I'm going to discuss microbiology in Philippine cuisine then and now. That is focusing on some of the so-called fermented foods in the Philippines for the Philippine cuisine boast of a wide variety of fermented foods. Now, a little on history of Philippine cuisine. Now, it is said that the Philippine cuisine is a melting pot of mixed cuisines. 
that is, it evolved from its Malayo Polynesian origins to a very efficient with influences from other cultures. During the pre-Hispanic period, okay, foods range from the usual livestock to various kinds of uh, fish and seafoods. Okay? The preferred method of food preparation during that time were boiling, steaming, and roasting. Of course, with the ingredients for cooking coming from locally raised livestock like uh, water buffalo, cows, and you also have okay, other sources like chicken, fish, and seafoods. Now, trading with the Chinese, that is during the Song Dynasty, a number of staple foods were introduced. Now, most notably, we have soy sauce, tofu, bean sprouts, pickled mustard greens. I think this is what we call as burung mustasa, okay, white radish, bamboo shoots, Chinese celery, now you also have lemongrass, and even fish sauce. Now, the Filipinos were then introduced the common cooking methods like stir frying and deep frying and making savory soup bases. Now, with Spanish colonization, that is from 1521 to 1898, they brought with them new cuisines. They emphasized the use of meat and dairy products, and at the same time introduced okay, products coming from the Americas, okay, like olive oil. They also introduced European seasonings, peppers, tomatoes, corn, and potatoes. Now, since meat and dairy products were considered a luxury, they were only prepared during special occasions, that is celebrations of Christmas, New Year, or that of fiestas. While Chinese foods was considered as a daily cuisine. Now the method of sauteing with garlic, onions, and tomatoes were introduced, and we are still practicing it, being remnants, that is remnants of Spanish influence. Now, from 1898 to 1949, the American influences added another dimension to Philippine cuisine, and that is speed and convenience. Okay. We are introduced to prepackaged food, canned foods, as well as fast foods. Now, despite these influences, widespread throughout the country is the use of fermentation and that coming up with uh, fermented foods, okay? So fermentation to improve the qualities of food and extend its shelf life. Now, let's have a little review of fermented foods. Now, fermented foods, these are food or beverages produced through controlled microbial growth and the conversion of foods to enzymatic action of major and minor food components. Now, production is dependent on microorganisms naturally present in raw foods. They may also be coming from the processing environment or through addition of starter cultures. Now, fermentation is performed as a method of preservation and at the same time, reduce the risk of contamination with pathogenic organisms. Now we have here an overview of the transformative nature of fermented foods. Of course, raw materials are fermented under special conditions in order to produce okay, interesting and desirable products. Okay, from the raw materials, okay, so you add fermenting organisms or fermentation organisms. Now, as mentioned, they may be naturally occurring in the raw materials or in the processing environment. So you have the so-called wild ferments or natural or spontaneous fermentation. Now, there are also cases wherein you can do box slapping. So when you say box slapping, you are getting inoculants or inoculum from a previously fermented batch, introducing it to the new batch. And then finally, of course, you have the use of starter cultures. Now, enzymes can also be added to raw materials. Okay, so you may have malt, as well, that is in 
uh, beer making, you have kaimusin, which is important in cheese making. You also have koji, that is for uh, soy sauce production. Then you have fungal, animal, as well as microbial enzymes being added into the mix. Next is the environment. Of course, it could either be aerobic or anaerobic environment. So if you are into alcoholic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation, then you need an aerobic environment. Now for alkaline fermentation or action of fungi, then it's more of aerobic. Now chemicals are also added into the mix, such as salt, nitrite, nitrate, sulfites. So these are substances, examples of substances or chemicals which are added into the mix in order to promote the growth of the fermenting organisms and at the same time, inhibiting unwanted ones. Of course, through the process of fermentation, okay, there is a corresponding change in the properties of the food. That is, uh, properties are changed, but the nutritive quality is not changed or it is even, it's changed or it's improved. Okay. Now, of course, you have flavors and aroma, okay, change in texture, appearance, and at the same time, preserving okay, the food. Comitant with it is the reduction in substances which are said to be harmful, such as the phytates, okay, which are very common in many legumes. So these phytates are substances which are capable of binding with minerals, so making it unavailable. Okay, to the organism. Now, the phytates are also capable of uh, minimizing or, or reducing the activity of some enzymes like pepsins and some proteases. Now, you also have a reduction in allergens as well as the FODMAPs or the fermentable oligo, di, mono, and polyols. Okay. So these are substances which are not absorbed in the intestine, but they are highly fermentable. So when they reach the intestine, they are fermented by organisms and the process produce a lot of gas and this can lead to gas pains as well as bloating. Now, again, in the process of fermentation, of course, bioactives are being produced. You have the synthesis of peptides, exopolypeptides, phenolics, even neurotransmitters, okay, as well as vitamins. There is also conversion of raw materials, that is carbohydrates, into organic acids, like lactate, acetate, formation of ethanol, and also the release of carbon dioxide. And with all of this, you have the formation of your fermented product. Now, microorganisms are important in the process of fermentation. Now, as mentioned, fermenting microorganisms may be coming from the raw materials or from the environment or directly introduced into the organism, uh, into the mix. Okay, now what are the common microorganisms which are involved in food fermentations? Definitely, you have the bacteria, the yeasts, and the molds. Now, in the case of the bacteria, of course, you have the lactic acid bacteria, which are considered as the most important bacteria in many fermentations. These organisms, that is, as the term implies, lactic acid bacteria, they are capable of utilizing a wide variety of carbohydrates and in the process produce lactic acid, which provides a so-called preservative effect to the food. Next to the lactic acid bacteria are the acetobacter group, that is acetobacter, which are capable of oxidizing alcohols in order to produce acetic acid. Now, of importance also in fermentation will be the species okay, from the bacillus or the bacillus species. So these are organisms which are capable of performing the so-called alkaline fermentation. And they are the ones which are usually involved in protein uh, degradation. And in the process, they are able to liberate ammonia, which can cause increase in pH of the so-called food sample, thereby inhibiting the growth of spoilage organisms. Now, we also have the yeasts. Okay? 
Now, in the case of the yeast, I think you're familiar with the very important saccharomyces, okay, which is commonly being used, that is in bread production, that is they're considered as the leavening agents. Now, saccharomyces and species saccharomyces are important groups of yeast which are being used in order to perform the process of fermentation that is in formation of alcoholic or fermented beverages. Now we also have species of candida, which are also important. That is in the production of uh, single cell proteins or SCPs. And finally, you have the molds. Now molds are also a very important group in food fermentation. Now, because of the fact that the molds are capable of elaborating a lot of hydrolytic enzymes, which are important in the production of some fermented products like soy sauce, okay? Now, these organisms are also capable of producing organic acids or elaborating organic acids. Now, one problem with the so-called molds is that these organisms are also agents of spoilage. So through their uh, through synthesis of hydrolytic enzymes, they're also capable of inducing unfavorable changes in food. Now, in addition, okay, you have the molds which are capable of producing toxins or mycotoxins, okay, which are really okay, affecting the health of the end users. Now, there are also molds which are being used that is for labor, okay production, like in the case of ceratocystis and also others which are for formation of tolerance. Now, what is the role of these organisms in food fermentations? As mentioned, they're important in food fermentation because of their ability to break down fermentable carbohydrates into organic acids, carbon dioxide, and alcohols. Similar, like the lactic acid bacteria, which are capable of producing substances which can lead to okay, preservation of the food. Okay? Now, you also have production of antimicrobial metabolites. There are organisms which are capable of producing substances which we refer to as bactericins, okay? which are now being used in order to kill pathogenic organisms in food, as well as contaminating organisms. Now, with this, with the action of these organisms, with the drop or increase in pH, formation of such metabolites, they are capable of increasing the shelf life of food. Of course, with the action of these organisms, they are able to enhance the digestibility of proteins and carbohydrates. Like in the case of proteins, they're able to break uh, bonds, okay, which are connecting the so-called units, okay, or the amino acids, making it available to the consumer. Now, you also have synthesis of vitamins, synthesis of minerals by these organisms, and at the same time, of course, increasing the bioavailability okay, of these substances. So after discussing or introducing the process of fermentation, the organisms which are involved in fermentation, okay, and their role in the process of fermentation, we now move on to the so-called traditional foods. Okay, so traditional fermented foods, and as mentioned earlier, the Philippine cuisine boasts of a wide array of traditional fermented foods. Now, fermented foods are considered as part and parcel of Filipino culture. That is, they're intimately connected with the life of the local people. And the three main island groups of the country each have their own fermented foods that cater to the local palate. Now, production of so-called fermented foods okay, are home-based usually home-based, they are produced in households with improvements being made as the process is being done from one generation to the next, okay? That is the process of fermentation that is to come up with a certain product is usually passed on from one generation to the other. And in the process of passing the so-called methods of fermentation, 
there are cases where in modifications are made, okay, and coming up with a product of a different set of properties. Now, please take note that traditional fermented foods are usually developed through trial and error. And there are cases wherein different ingredients are being added, okay? And as such, okay, the quality of the so-called fermented product will vary from one maker to the other. So product quality varies, okay, of course, from one preparation method to another, okay? This is also due to the so-called rough estimation of materials which are being used during preparation. And usually in household preparation, of course, there is simply estimation of the different ingredients okay, in producing the so-called product. And as such, okay, a different set or minor changes in the so-called properties of the so-called product will definitely change. And one such property will be the microbial composition of such a product. So in general, microbial composition per product, per region is unique and highly variable. And because of this, it is very, uh, there is increased possibility that looking or studying the microorganisms or the microbial composition of such a product, you will be able to, in a way, identify or discover new organisms. Now, what are the different traditional fermented products which are, say, uh, available, okay, which are being produced in different regions of the country? Okay, so for the traditional products, as we all know, there are a wide variety of fermented Okay, or ethnic foods, ethnic fermented foods. And so for today, I will simply discuss some of the so-called uh, traditional fermented foods and look at the microbiology of these fermented foods. So we start with the famous, of course, white soft cheese, which is properly uh, popularly known as quesong puti. Okay. <clears throat> now, Queso puti is a traditional cheese made from cow or caraboose milk using rennet and lactic acid bacteria. Now, as we all know, rennet, okay, it is actually okay, a set of enzymes, okay, proteolytic enzymes, which are capable of causing the curdling of milk or the curdling of casein in milk with chymosine as the main enzyme and other proteolytic enzymes present. And this is usually observed okay, from the stomach of ruminants like cows and carabaos. And of course, you have the lactic acid bacteria. Now, considering quesong puti production, there are four regions in the country which are actually producing quesong puti. Of course, here we have in Laguna, especially in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Laguna. So queso puti is one of their uh, fermented foods which, are, which is being produced. Now you also have queso puti being produced in Bulacan as well as Cavite. Now in the Visayas, you have Cebu also producing queso puti. But if you consider, if you compare the process which is being used in producing queso puti, okay, Please take note that the procedure being used in Laguna as well as in Cebu involves the process of fermentation. So they do make use of lactic acid bacteria. Now in the case of quesong puti being produced in Bulacan as well as in Cavite, it is not considered as a fermented food since vinegar is being used in order to cause curdling of the milk. Okay, now for the fermented queso puti, okay, it is actually a product of natural fermentation. The initial microflora, of course, of 
kesong puti depends on the hygienic processes which are being used or which are being followed that is in collecting the raw materials. Okay, and of course, you have to consider okay, the microorganisms which may be coming from the person who is collecting the said raw materials. And of course, okay, if you consider these sources of such organisms, okay, you may have the presence of aerobic pathogenic microorganisms. And of course, okay, you also have the presence of the lactic acid bacteria. Now, addition of salt, as discussed earlier, that salt is being added okay, into the mix, okay, encourages the growth of the lactic acid bacteria. So looking at the microorganisms which are being used or which are involved in the fermentation process, of course, you have the lactic acid bacteria like Lactococcus lactis. You also have Enterococcus, Corinibacterium vitarumen. You also have Providentia, as well as Lactobacillus casein. Now, the process of fermentation, of course, with the addition of salt, encourages the growth of Lactococcus lactis. And this organism is the major producer okay, of the acid. Okay? It produces lactic acid until the concentration reaches 1%. Okay? And at such concentration, this will now inhibit, of course, the growth of contaminating organisms, and at the same time, inhibiting the growth of the producing organism. And because of this, Another lactic acid bacterium, which is more tolerant to acid, and that is Lactobacillus casei, will now become dominant and continue the process. Now, as mentioned, acidity limits the growth of contaminating microorganisms. Now, the traditional way of producing this quesum puti depends on the naturally occurring microflora. Now, that is the usual practice. Now, at present, in order to come up with a good quality okay, quesum puti, now, in the process of fermentation, starter cultures are already being used. Of course, these are made up of lactic acid bacteria. So you have the Lactococcus lactis, as mentioned earlier. Now, you also have Lactococcus cremoris, okay, as well as diacetylactis. So in the starter culture, these organisms may be used in combination or they may be used as single inoculant. Okay. So regions of consumption for this kesuputi, of course, you have Central and Southern Luzon, as well as the Visayas. Moving on, okay, another fermented food will be the fermented shrimp cooked rice mixture, which is locally known as balaw-balaw. So this is okay, a fermented food which is said to be popular, very popular in Pampanga. Okay? So it's popular in Pampanga, but I think it's also popular in other regions of the country. Now, this balaw-balaw or burung hipon, is a traditional food, of course, which is consumed as a side dish. Now, it can be used as a dipping sauce, okay? That is a dipping sauce for grilled, roasted, or fried fish, and in some cases, also for okra as well as eggplant. Now, it is also being used as a condiment or being eaten as a main dish, that is, after sauteing it in onion and garlic in vegetable oil. Now, balaw balaw, okay? So there is a similar product in Thailand and that is known as kung chow or kung sam. Now, similar with kesong puti, okay? Now, balaw balaw is a product of natural fermentation. Now, the microorganisms which are involved in fermentation, you have the following. So you have the lactic acid bacteria like Lactobacillus plantarum, Leuconostoc mesenteroides, Pediococcus cerevisiae. Now you also have bacillus species as well as corymiforms. 
Okay. Now, the fermentation of balaw-balaw is carried out in a sequential manner. Okay. Now, the first four days is said to be dominated by leuconostoc mesenteroides, which plays a major role in acid production. Now, on the fifth day, okay, pediococcus predominates. And finally, on the seventh day, okay, Lactobacillus plantarum becomes the dominant organism. So this is okay, a sequential fermentation. And it is said that with okay, the acid production of one organism, it promotes the growth of the second organism, but inhibiting the growth of the first organism. Okay, so sequential fermentation. Now, since okay, balo balaw is said to be a natural fermentation, okay, the initial microflora again will depend on the raw materials used, okay, of course, on the vessel, okay, for mixing the equipment and the person who is preparing the said product or the said food. Now, the type of shrimp being used, okay, so we have peneus or macrobacum, macrobacum being, uh, being used. Okay, will also affect the existing microflora. Now, it is possible that pathogenic organisms like Salmonella, coliforms, uh, Salmonella and Staphylococcus, as well as coliforms, may accompany this raw okay, shrimp which is being used. But with the development of an acidic pH, with the development of lactic acid. Okay, these organisms are killed. Now, traditional, okay, so if we consider traditional way of preparing balaw balaw, as mentioned, it employs natural fermentation. Now, at present, so that is now, okay, that uh, starter cultures are being used in their production, okay? So that is coming from okay, the balaw balaw itself, okay? Of course, with the study which was conducted or pioneered by Dr. Sanchez, okay? Organisms or lactic acid bacteria, which are more efficient in the process of fermentation, okay? Of course, coming from the product, okay? Analyzed, studied, are now being used as starter cultures. And because of the introduction of starter cultures, the seven day fermentation is now reduced to three to four days. And at, the, and at the same time, the product produced is said to have better aroma, better taste, and more stable. Now, the third fermented product that I will discuss is fermented mustard leaves, which is burung mustasa. And of course, okay, in the case of burung mustasa, this is a traditional pickle product from the Philippines that is from the Luzon area. Okay, and it is usually consumed as an appetizer or as an ingredient in the preparation okay, of meat and fish. Now, a similar product is also being produced in Thailand, making use of mustard leaves as ingredients. So you have the Pak Siang Dong that is in Thailand. Now, in producing this burung mustasa, of course, it relies again on the natural microflora. Okay, so produced by natural fermentation of mustard leaves and rice broth that is for three to four days or until the desired acidity is reached. Okay, now the desired acidity for Guru Mustasa, that is the, the final product should be 1% acidity. Now, after the process of fermentation, Guru uh, Mustasa is usually stored at a temperature of 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, that is for full development of flavors. 
Now, the microorganisms which are okay, involved in the process of producing is this buru mustasa are as follows. You have, of course, the lactic acid bacteria. You have leuconostoc mesenteroides, enterococcus fecalis, lactobacillus plantarum, streptobacillus species. You have the fusobacterium as well as wisella. Okay. Now, regions of consumption, so this okay, uh, fermented product is popular in Luzon. Another product, okay, which is really part of the history of the Filipinos is the sugar cane wine or basi. Now, basi is okay, an indigenous alcoholic beverage involving spontaneous fermentation of sugar to ethanol and conversion of small portions of sugars to lactic acid. Now, as mentioned, it is okay, part of the Filipino history. It is one of the oldest traditional alcoholic beverages in the country. Now, it is produced or it has been produced in the Ilocos region since the 17th century, okay? And in fact, there is uh, part of the so-called history of the Philippines is the Basi Revolution, which occurred, I think, in 1807. Okay, so that is uh, during the that time. Okay, the Spanish government okay, uh, prohibited the local production or the production of Basi, and because of that. Okay, came the so-called Basi Revolution, okay? Now, uh, in the case of Basi, as mentioned, it is prepared by storing boiled sugar cane and inoculating it with bubod, okay? Bubod. Now, bubod is actually, uh, that is your inoculant, which is prepared by using steam rice, okay? Which is inoculated with microorganisms. And also, okay, you have uh, some leaves, bark of uh, plants, which are being, okay, which are part of the so-called bubod formation. Okay, so bubod formation, okay, is important, and usually this is being maintained for three months. So for three months, the bubod is active. Okay. And after three months, it has to be reactivated through the use, through the production of another batch of bubod with backstopping being used in order to come up with the inoculant. Okay, now what are the microorganisms which are important for their fermentation? Okay, so this is an alcoholic beverage. Okay, so definitely, as mentioned earlier, okay, you need the action of yeasts, okay, in its fermentation. Okay, so you have Saccharomyces cerevisiae being used. You have Saccharomyces capensis, okay. Now also present in the process of fermentation, you have Endomycopsis pibuligera as well as E. vinai. okay. Now other organisms which are detected to be present in the process of fermentation, you have the Candida species as well as Turulopsis. And since there is a small amount of lactic acid being present in the so-called product. Definitely, you have the presence of organisms or the lactic acid bacteria, specifically Pediococcus pentaceous and Lactobacillus KCI. Now, similar with other fermented products, the traditional way of fermenting or producing basi, okay, is through the use of its natural microflora. So definitely, okay, the quality of basi will depend on the microflora which is existing in its raw materials or in all the materials used as well as the bubod. Now at present, okay, again, through the efforts of Dr. Sanchez, okay, starter cultures are already available, okay? Now, the starter cultures which have been prepared, okay, 
or which are now available for BASI formation, okay, are the ones which are used for lactic acid production and not the bubod. So you still need to rely on the bubod, but okay, uh, better product, better quality is produced with the use of starter cultures, specifically, you have your uh, Pediococcus pentaceous as well as Lactobacillus casei. Now, in some okay, uh, institutions, okay, they have also okay, uh, prepared starter cultures of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we now have starter cultures of the yeasts as well as the bacteria in preparing your VASI. Okay, now how is VASI being prepared? Of course, okay, so you have your sugar cane juice, okay, and then it is uh, inoculated with bubon, okay, and it is allowed to stand for a month, that is for fermentation to occur. And after one month, okay, uh, that is, it should be placed in an earthen jar, okay? So fermentation occurs, and then the cup is placed, and then it is cemented with wood ashes, and it is allowed to ferment for addition of six to 12 months. That is for the process of fermentation to be completed, and at the same time, that is for aging of the so-called vasi. Okay, so during storage, of course, the fermentation will proceed until okay, the organisms will stop growing and then it is then followed by aging. Okay, so that is the sugar cane vasi. And I think there is another fermented okay, uh, sugar cane wine, which is also uh, famous in the uh, which is also popular in the country, and that is tapui. Now, again, the so-called procedure also make use of okay, bubod as source of organisms. Another popular product, fermented product, especially for the Filipinos, okay, is the fish paste as well as the fish sauce. So we have our bagoong and patis. Now, Fish paste and fish sauce, these are prepared in similar manner, except that the latter is allowed to ferment. That is the so-called, uh, uh, sorry, it is for the, right, the fish sauce or the patis, okay? To ferment longer, that is until the flesh of the fish disintegrates into a liquid state. Now in the fermentation process, okay, or in the fermentation mixture, now the solid portion that is your bagoong, while the liquid phase is the patis. Now, of course, as seen in our picture, so this is bagoong is that is characterized by a reddish brown color. Okay, and it's said to have some sort of a cheesy flavor. Now, there are also similar products in Southeast Asian countries that is similar with Bagoong. Now, they have Kapi in Thailand, Trasi in Indonesia, and you have the Belakan or Belachan of Malaysia, Ngapi of Burma, and the Namka of Vietnam. Now, as for the patis or the fish sauce, now this is the clear straw yellow color to amber, okay? So that is the color of patis, depending on the type of fish which is commonly being used. Now, what are the fish which are commonly being used? You have the anchovies, okay? The tamban, okay? Tamban is also being used in patis production, okay? Now, there are also similar products, okay, in our Southeast Asian neighbors, like the Nuk Nam in Cambodia and Vietnam, the Yuhu in China, the Shotsuru in Japan, 
Now you also have Budu in Malaysia, Nampla in Thailand and Lao. Now you also have Ketchup Ikan in Indonesia and Ngan Pia Ying in Burma. Now the microorganisms which are involved in the process of fermentation. Now before, people used to think that the production of patis is not a fermentation process. And that is it's due to the salt, which extracts the liquid or the fluid from the cells of the fish. But through the studies conducted, okay, they have shown that okay, microorganisms are indeed involved in the so-called process. So you have bacillus species, okay, micrococcus species, now pediococcus helophilus, sorry, that is pediococcus helophilus, as well as some penicillium or penicillium species is observed to be present in the so-called fermentation process and believed to play a role, and they play a role in the fermentation process. Now, if you consider the initial microflora, which are dominant at the start or the, at the initial stages of the fermentation process, definitely gram-negative rod-shaped bacteria coming from the raw materials okay, will be the dominant organisms. Now, with the introduction of salt, okay, these organisms will be killed. Now, the enzymes, which will be produced by the bacillus species, specifically bacillus satellis, as well as bacillus coagulans, okay, together with the enzymes coming from the fish, okay, uh, fish gut, our fish intestine are able to cause protein hydrolysis. Now, bacterial enzymes are found to be or are said to be responsible or they are found to be responsible to the deamination and the decarboxylation of amino acids. That is to produce lower fatty acids and amides that will give the characteristic flavors of the product. But in the so-called process of fermentation, the dominant organism that is in the entire process of fermentation, of course, after inhibiting the contaminating organisms, it is said that you have another bacillus species and that is bacillus pumilus. Okay, so that is the dominant species during the process of fermentation. Now, responsible for the early stages in the fermentation process, of course, as mentioned, you have Bacillus coagulans, Bacillus satellis, as well as Bacillus megatherium. While another species of Bacillus, as well as the Micrococci, that is Bacillus lichenoformis, okay, Micrococcus colpogenes, Micrococcus ruseus, Micrococcus variants, and species of Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus are said to be, okay, responsible for the process of fermentation that is at the latter stages okay, of the process. Okay. Now, as for the fermentation process, then and now, okay, uh, the same procedure okay, is still being used, although uh, in addition to the so-called fermentation process, okay, there are other pre-treatment or post-treatment which are being done on the product. That is to make it safe for consumption. Now, this is okay, another fermented product, okay, and that is the rice cakes. Okay, now, if you consider puto, so this is puto, okay, so it is said to be fermented, okay, because of the action of a leavening agent. Now, there are also rice cakes which are not fermented, okay? So, yung uh, puto bumbong, okay? So, that is an example of a uh, cake which is not fermented. But for most of the puto, like puto binyan, okay? So, these are fermented uh, rice cakes. Now,
Puto is prepared from ground, polished rice grains, soaked in water, and allowed to ferment spontaneously for 14 hours before steaming. Of course, we know puto as a white, okay, spongy type cake, which is sweet and usually comes with, or which is being eaten with grated coconut, okay? Now, you consider the microorganisms which are involved in fermentation okay, of rice cakes still have the lactic acid bacteria, specifically Leuconosoc mesenteroides, Enterococcus fecalis, as well as Pediococcus cerevisiae. Now, in addition, okay, to serve as the living agent that is the organism introducing carbon dioxide to make okay, puto spongy will be Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now, where does the inoculant for puto okay, production come from? Okay. Now, for puto formation, backslapping is commonly being done. That is for the traditional method of preparing puto. Okay, so inoculum comes from a day old mixture from the previous batch. Now, during the first stage of fermentation, that is, that is in the first nine hours of fermentation, okay, the organism which predominates, you have, of course, the three organisms you have Lognostoc mesenteroides, Enterococcus fecalis, as well as Pediococcus. So these organisms produce the lactic acid, which inhibit the growth and proliferation of the indigenous microflora coming from the soaked rice. So you have the natural micro or the contaminating organisms from the raw materials, okay, which are inhibited by the action of the lactic acid bacteria. Now simultaneously. The yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, okay, increases in, in cell number and acts on the sugars to produce large amounts of carbon dioxide in order to come up with the spongy effect. Now, after the nine hours of fermentation, okay, lye is added into the mixture. Okay? So lye is added into the mixture in order to neutralize the mixture. Okay, so you have light, that is the basic substance being added in order to neutralize the acidity. And after addition of light, fermentation is allowed to continue for five more hours before the product or the okay, resulting okay, puto is steamed. Now, of course, regions of consumption for puto will be the whole country. And we now have puto. Okay, uh, with varying colors, okay, which can be sold, which are being sold in the market. Okay. Now, improvement. So comparing the traditional method of producing puto with what is being done now. Okay, so improvement in production, okay, has been done. So in order to come up with, okay, some safe puto, okay? So starter cultures are now being used. So you now have starter cultures of the lactic acid bacteria, as well as the yeast, which are now available commercially, okay? And at the same time, okay, powdered rice is now being used, okay? So before you need to do, okay, the actual, grinding of rice grains, but now powdered rice is available for use, okay? And with that, of course, there will be a decreased number of contaminating organisms. Now, there's still, okay, other organisms, or sorry, other fermented products, which are or which have been reported, and in fact, these have been reported by uh, Dr. Sanchez, okay, 
So an extensive study was done by Dr. Sanchez about this traditional fermented foods in the country, okay? And there are other fermented foods like buru ista, okay? So we have buru ista being used in Central Luzon. Now there are also buru ista which are being okay, prepared in the Visayas or even in Mindanao, okay? So in buru ista, of course you have, you have to make use of both fresh water or vacuous water fish, and again, rice and salt, okay, are important ingredients, okay, and for the microorganisms being used in fermentation, okay, so you have the different lactic acid bacteria, which are shown okay, in the table, and burung ista is being used as a side dish, okay, or as a condiment, and in some cases, it can also be used as a variant, that is, if properly. Uh, uh, that is ipsotade okay, with, of course, the usual garlic, onion, and vegetable oil. Okay, so regions of consumption for burung ista, you have the central and southern Luzon. Now, I think this is the Visaya, so this is uh, still burung ista in the Visayas, and I think it is, uh, it is referred to as tinabal. Okay, that is, uh, I hope I uh, pronounce it right, you have tinabal, okay, making use of parrot fish or frigate fish, and of course, salt, okay? And in the process of fermentation, you have different lactic acid bacteria, okay? You have the locunosto, the lactobacillus. Now, in addition, you also have, okay, uh, other organisms like the streptomyces. Now, present, of course, coming from the raw material that is the fish themselves, you may also have the presence of Staphylococcus as well as Archaeligenes and Pseudomonas species, but the process of fermentation is okay, capable of inhibiting the growth of such organism. Okay, so uses, it has been used as a side dish and again as vayan. Okay, now you also have Cinemac. Now, uh, this is, this make use of sugarcane juice as well as spices. Uh, I think this is popular in the Visayas and Mindanao region, and that is being used as a condiment and seasoning. Uh, unfortunately, okay, uh, based on the resources available, that is, there is no report yet as to the microorganisms which are responsible in producing such a product. Uh, such a product. Now, the same is true with pangasi or pangasi, okay, uh, that is making use of rice as a substrate. Okay, and this is an alcoholic beverage. Maybe it is similar to tapuy. Okay, and it is popular in Mindanao. So for these two fermented products, I think, okay, it is important that the organisms responsible for fermentation be identified or be enumerated. So maybe, okay, or is it also possible that you can see, okay, noble organisms from such fermentation process. Now you have tapuy. That is an alcoholic beverage, which is famous, uh, which is popular in the swan. Of course, okay, for this uh, process of, uh, for this uh, rice wine. Okay, so this is rice wine. The organisms being used for fermentation. You have Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You also have aspergillus as well as rice sucos. So fungi are being used for their fermentation. Okay, so that is, Okay, presenting the so-called microbiology of some of the traditional fermented foods. Now, also part of microbiology, okay, that is uh, in Philippine cuisine is for us to know what are the health benefits brought about by these fermented foods, okay? So we are fond of eating fermented foods because of the so-called health benefits which are obtained from such uh, products, okay? Now, as mentioned by Sandier et al., okay, that is, these are just some of the so-called benefits which can be derived from fermented foods. Okay, of course, with the action of organisms, okay, that is, you now have bioavailability of vitamins and minerals. And at the same time, these organisms are also okay, synthesizing amino acids as well as vitamins okay, and adding it into the product. So examples of vitamin like B2, B9, BK, as well, uh, B12, sorry, and K, and vitamin K, and also 
in some of the super fermented foods, uh, limiting amino acids like lysine is also being introduced or synthesized by the organisms and added into the product. Now, other health benefits, of course, you have the synthesis of exopolysaccharides, and this is true for many lactic acid bacteria, and it is believed to have the so-called prebiotic properties, which are capable of stimulating the growth of okay, good organisms within our system. And at the same time, such exopolysaccharides are also believed to have the so-called cholesterol-lowering activity. That is, it is uh, proposed that the so-called exopolysaccharide is capable of binding with this cholesterol, okay? And the process lowering its concentration in the body. Now, you also have, as mentioned earlier, production of bactericins. And in fact, bactericins are added, or they are considered as or part of grass, okay? That is generally recommended as safe, okay? And these bactericins have the so-called antimicrobial activities or properties which are capable of inhibiting pathogenic organisms. Now, it is also being mentioned that you have synthesis of substances like sphingolipids, okay? Which are said to be bioactive compounds, and that is they have the so-called anti-carcinogenic activity and at the same time, antimicrobial properties. Now, although it is not yet clear the actual mechanism, but it is said that the so-called sphingoly sphingolipids, okay, uh, acts on the cell membrane of the organism. And then finally, you also have the so-called bioactive peptides, okay, uh, which are said to have the so-called anti-hypertensive activity. So you may have angiotensin converting enzyme peptide inhibitors, which are said to be present like uh, valyl, propyl, prolyl, prolyl, and isoleucyl, okay, prolyl, prolyl, which are said to okay, cause relaxation of the blood vessels, thereby leading to lower blood pressure. So these are some of the so-called benefits, okay, enumerated benefits of uh, consuming or consumption of fermented foods. That is, of course, adding to the other benefits, okay, which we already know regarding fermented foods. Now, this is just to okay, uh, enumerate some of the so-called bactericins okay, being produced by the lactic acid bacteria, okay, which are said to have activity against gram-positive or gram-negative, or both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, as well as the fungi. So you have the nisin A, bulgarican, pedicin A, okay, pedicin ACH. So these are just examples of the many bactericins which are being produced by the lactic acid bacteria. Okay. Now still part, of course, uh, microbiology of these fermented foods will be the health risks which are associated with fermented foods. Now it is believed that fermented foods, okay, and it is really proven that fermented foods are able to okay, inhibit the growth of pathogenic organisms, okay. Uh, they are less likely to serve as vehicle for food infection or intoxication. That is, some pathogenic microorganisms are capable of producing toxins which are being released into the food, okay. So it is said that fermented foods are capable of, if not totally, okay, that is remove such toxic substances in our food, okay? But they are not as stable, okay? So fermented foods are not as stable as canned or frozen foods. And as mentioned earlier, the quality of the fermented foods will depend on the hygienic processes okay, or practices which are followed in their production as well as all the materials, raw materials which are being used in their okay, production. So the following risks are of importance. Of course, in fermented food, okay, the use of previously contaminated raw materials. And as we all know, in traditional okay, uh, fermented foods production of this uh, the traditional way of producing fermented foods, of course, okay, uh, in some cases, okay, 
the raw materials are not being pasteurized, they are not being sterilized since okay, uh, people are depending on the action of microorganisms in order to uh, kill the pathogenic organisms. But there are cases wherein okay, the process of fermentation is not done properly and as such, these organisms are for organisms, even their toxic products are not removed from the product, okay? So there is lack of pasteurization, okay? That is with okay, the materials which are being used in their production. And of course, the use of poorly controlled natural fermentations, okay? Ito nga, yung traditional way of producing, okay? Uh, these fermented products or of suboptimal fermentation starter cultures. Now, majority of the traditional fermented products rely on the natural flora, okay? So there are cases wherein, okay, the starter or the cultures responsible in fermentation is not that high in concentration and as such, okay, or they are of poor quality in the so-called fermentation process. So you come up with a suboptimum fermentation. You also have inadequate storage or maturation conditions, and that is okay, allowing contamination to occur, and at the same time, enabling survival of pathogens, okay, for their growth as well as toxin production. And last, that is with fermented products, although we uh, there are fermented products which are being cooked, okay, prior to consumption, there are also some Okay, which are not being processed or which are not properly heated. Okay? And as such, okay, the pathogenic organisms which may be present or the toxic substances present in such a product may not be inactivated, killed or inactivated. Now, and this is true for so-called uh, fermented products is the presence of biogenic amines. Okay? So biogenic amines are very common, are said to be common in fermented foods. Now, biogenic amines, this is a group of mildly toxic compounds which can be formed in fermented foods. Now, it's said that approximately 1,000 parts per million is supposed to elicit toxicity. Okay, so listed are the common okay, biogenic amines which are being formed. So you have ethylamine, putrescine, you have histamine, now, cadaverine, okay, phenylethylamine, okay, so these are the biogenic amines. And please take note that the major biogenic amine producer will be members of the family Enterobacteriaceae. And it is also reported that, okay, Enterococcus is an organism which is capable of, okay, of producing such biogenic amine. And in fact, in one report, it is said that fermentation involving such organism is able to produce around 600 ppm of biogenic amines. Okay, and so it is important that we look at the so-called organisms which are being used in fermentation, okay? We need to select as well as optimize our starter cultures. Select for the starter culture, which is not capable of producing such bioamines, okay, or if it produces such bioamines at a concentration which is tolerable, okay, and of course, uh, you need to perform or to do or to follow good hygiene practices, especially in okay, producing such fermented products, and at the same time, ensure wholesomeness of raw materials. Uh, it's very common that is in. Okay, that is in the industry that okay, before they make use of a certain raw material for their product, they really check the quality of the raw materials. And I think okay, for us who are into producing fermented products, it is also a must that we ensure the safety okay, or the wholesomeness of the raw materials that we are using. using so that we can come up with okay, a good quality or a high quality product that is really safe for consumption. Okay, so with that, I end my presentation and thank you very much for okay, listening.
much, uh, Dr. Uh, Noel, um, for the, this very informative, very wonderful talk. I uh, hope uh, everyone uh, is still uh, on their screen. Uh, we uh, know that uh, this is very close to our stomach, the one that is being presented before us. Uh, and uh, let us now have uh, uh, time for the open forum. Uh, to our audience uh, in Zoom, please use the Q&A uh, feature to, to send your questions. To those who are watching uh, YouTube, via YouTube live, you can leave your questions in the comment box and our technical assistants will copy it uh, uh, to Zoom. We will try to answer as many questions as possible given the time allotted. A question from Shaina Lupalar. Is there any case of Puti manufacturer in Mindanao? Knowing marami pong cow's milk from Bukid. No, no. Unfortunately, okay, I am not familiar with, okay, uh, she's when she's production in Mindanao, uh, based on the reports that I, uh, or in the papers that I have used for today's presentation, and based on that counts given by Dr. Sanchez and those who are working on uh, fermented foods, okay, it is only in the uh, Luzon and Visayas area where, okay, quesong puti is being produced, okay. I'm really not that familiar with, okay, quesong uh, puti production in Mindanao, but I hope to, okay. Now, since my wife is from Mindanao, and I think, okay, uh, I will try to check if there are indeed, okay, although there are not that known uh, households which are producing quesong puti. Okay. Uh, now, uh, yeah, yeah, for that matter, uh, I, I, I'm from, from, from Mindanao. There are also those that produce somewhere in areas that have Tagalog uh, mm -hmm. media. So coming from Luzon and Visayas area. So the only difference with the Luzon and Visayas area is that I think uh, more salt is being added in the Visayas, Visayan way of producing queso puti as compared to that of the Luzon uh, procedure. Okay. Now, what does elaboration mean in the context of fermentation? Okay. Now, elaborate. Okay. So, uh, for organisms okay, uh, growing in the fermentation mash, okay, it is it's same as they are capable of synthesizing substances okay, in okay, the fermentation mash. Okay? So elaboration of substances that is uh, synthesis of okay, like bioactive peptides okay, in the fermentation mass, or that is as the process of fermentation is ongoing. Okay, now, we have another question. Is the use of rennet traditional or was it, was it introduced in the modern times? Okay, now the use of rennet actually uh, is already being practiced even before, okay? That is, okay, of course, the bus, we all know the cheese production, okay, was by accident. Okay, so cheese production was by accident, and okay, of course it happened in other countries. So cheese production was by accident, and they were able to okay take note of the so-called rennet coming from okay the stomach of the ruminants. So I think okay the process of rennet production of rennet use in cheese production goes a long, long way. Of, uh, 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 it's been used okay for quite a long time. But, okay, if you consider rennet production now, okay, so as mentioned, these enzymes come from the stomach of the calf, okay, young calf. But now, okay, what is being done is you make or produce rennet through the use of microbial enzymes, okay? So institutions like, okay, biotech here in New Pils Banos is now uh, producing Okay, rennet, that is microbial rennet, okay, that can be used in production, in cheese production, okay? 
Now, another question from still from Sir Raymond Makapagal. Tapoy, I know it is made with rice. It also uses bubon. Is there any sugar? No, no. There is no sugar cane wine. So uh, sugar cane wine or sugar cane alcohol is different. So you have basi, okay, for sugar cane wine. But for tapoy, it is really uh, rice wine. Mm. Okay, now another question. Some puto have that wine like taste and upon confirmation from makers, they use yeast as leavening agent. Some puto nowadays don't have the wine like taste. Can taste be used in general as an indicator that puto was made using microorganisms as leavening agent? Okay, now, uh, I think this will depend on Okay, how you're able to perceive or how you're able to taste the so-called uh, alcohol-like, okay, or wine-like taste in your puto. Now, I don't think that this can be used as an indicator, okay, that uh, such organism was used as a labeling agent, okay? So, um, so far, uh, unfortunately, in my case, I'm not really that sensitive when, with regard to this wine-like taste, okay? I have not okay, tasted puto, okay, with such a wine-like uh, wine -like taste, okay? So I don't think taste can be used as a general indicator. If puto is made use, is, is puto was produced using microorganisms as leavening agent, okay? Okay, now are there studies in PA uh, in the Philippines which proved the microbiome composition of the dish? Yes, okay, there are okay, studies which have been conducted in order to determine what are the microorganisms present, okay, in fermented food. Now, if you consider the microorganisms which were okay, discussed during the presentation, now these organisms were, okay, uh, detected or identified, that is through the use of culture-based method, okay? So they make use of culture-based method. Now with okay, the molecular methods, the culture-independent methods, you can now really determine, okay, what are the microorganisms which are found to be present in the so-called product? But the thing is, okay, with all those organisms present, uh, you can determine diversity. But which of the said organisms, which is actually performing the so-called fermentation process, actually performing, okay, the or producing the so-called important substances in the fermented food? Okay, I think you need to do uh, what you call this more of uh, like data mining. That is, of course, with the uh, molecular methods, that is with sequencing, okay, full genome sequencing or sequencing of the organisms present, you will be able to see what are the different genes present and you, are, you will be able to predict, okay, which of these organisms, okay, is possibly, okay, working in the so-called fermentation process. But you also have to take note that environmental conditions will definitely have an effect on the activity of these organisms. So they may have the genes present to perform one important activity in the process of fermentation, but it's possible that the conditions existing prevent such organism from growing or from performing such activity. So with uh, the sequencing method, with the new technology, you can really determine who are the organisms which are found to be present, which are present in the so-called uh, fermentation product. Yeah, I, I can now see here uh, 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 Doc Noel. So with the breakdown of uh, food system, do you see issues rising in the quality of our uh, food uh, fermented uh, food uh, products? Okay. Now, I think there are really agencies which, okay, uh, government agencies, of course, the uh, fermented products, of course, it is a source of income. And I think okay, there are indeed government agencies which still can 
regulate okay, the so-called uh, fermented products which are being okay, produced, especially those which are, be, uh, which are being sold okay, in the market. So we have this, uh, I think Philippine national standards. So there are uh, Philippine national standards for some of the so-called fermented foods, especially those which are being sold in the market or those which are commercially available. Right, okay. And there is also another questions about fermentation of lambanog. Uh, uh, recently, we have an issue of uh, food poisoning. Uh, do you have uh, uh, feedback on this one? Okay, so I think it is in the process of fermentation because uh, with alcoholic beverages, we are really after the ethanol. Okay? So it is possible that in the process of fermentation as affected by the conditions, methanol is also being produced. Okay, it may be one, it is possible it's one of the products which are being produced, okay, and methanol is the one which is toxic, okay. So it is the one which is toxic, so ito yung talaga nakakamatay and not the ethanol which is being produced. So if, in the process of fermentation, of course, it is very important that, okay, once you have your product, it is very important that you determine, okay, or you detect for the presence of such toxic compound. Right. Uh, there are many questions here uh, and there are many uh, also items na talaga nagpapasalamat with this very informative uh, lectures of yours. Um, I'm still browsing. There are many. So uh, I hope, yes. The time now is uh, 11.34. Uh, I guess uh, we can entertain uh, two more probably. Uh, does the process of fermentation have something to do with uh, ah, well, well, this is about lambanog already. So, do you think the whole genome sec sequencing of starter culture? Um, what is this one? Uh, all right. Uh, do you? Uh, 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 okay. So, this is something to do about uh, the starter culture, uh, the sequencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sorry, but uh, I cannot. Uh, can you see it anyway, Noel? Uh, can we? Okay, sir. Uh, we look. Uh, so, okay. How yeah. much are you using? Okay. Sequencing, yes, sorry. What are the common characteristics can be used to assess? Anybody have any question? Uh, ano po yung question na ano niya? Mm. Yeah, it has to do on sequencing, probably. Sequencing. Uh, yeah, uh, probably on sequencing of. Uh, uh, those uh, uh, products. Yeah. Sure, Noel. Uh, if I oh, may. Yes, Paul. Yes, Paul. The question is Do you think the whole genome sequencing of starter culture uh, members uh, mm, yes. is a good way to profile the safety and health benefits of uh, those microbes? Definitely. Okay, definitely. Okay, so through genome sequencing, you're able to determine what are the genes which are present in the organism. Okay, so you can determine. Uh, are there genes okay, in these organisms which are capable of elaborating or uh, which can lead to uh, synthesis of compounds which are toxic or synthesis of enzymes which can, in its activity, produce toxic substances in the fermented food. So it is really okay, uh, very important that you sequence okay, as much as possible. Okay, sequence the so-called uh, genome of the organism, okay? Because uh, in that way, you will be able to see, okay? And in predict, okay? That is predict, okay? Are there genes which are important for the process of fermentation? And are there genes which can lead to formation of toxic compounds like toxins, mycotoxins? It's possible that the organism is very good in fermentation, but the problem is, it is capable of producing toxic substances. Like in the case of uh, this Rockefeller cheese, okay, that is the organism being used in aging. Okay, so Rockefeller, uh, penicillium Rockefeller is being used for aging. But the problem with this organism is that it is also capable of elaborating okay, mycotoxins. So I think it is really important that you okay, profile okay, the starter cultures that you will be using, especially if your product is really for, okay, uh, to be sold in the market. Okay, and then there's also a question about uh, 
uh, expiration. So, uh, do you have feedback on that one regarding uh, expiry product? Okay, so best before use. Okay, now for a best before use. Now, of course, it is uh, within law. The, there is a law that there should be the so called expiration. Okay, so expiration of products. Now, that is best before. Okay, now for some of the so called products which are okay, processed or heated, okay, so it's possible that the organism is not growing already or it is no longer producing harmful substances, but still, okay, of course, okay, as much as possible, okay, uh, you eat the food within the period, okay, until okay, the date of expiration. Siyempre, the uh, so-called property of the so of the food is also what they call is um, deteriorating, okay, especially if it goes beyond the expiration date. So fermented products they said to be stable. But still, it is a must that you consider the so-called expiration date. So it, because it's also possible that deterioration can occur. Okay, maybe uh, some substances are produced. Okay, in the so-called food, which will now be harmful to you. Because with expiration, they consider properties of the food, and how will they maintain such a property? Okay, and beyond that, normally, okay, it is said to be of low quality, and maybe in some cases not safe for consumption. Yeah. Meron ding tanong about uh, sa DTI, kung naiisip daw ng DTI yung standardization ng fermentations. Okay. Uh, Smashing nga po, meron po tayong ano, uh, what you call this, yung national standards, Philippine national standards, that is for uh, some of the fermented products which are being produced. Now, fortunately, I'm not familiar with that uh, being done by DTI, pero... So think naman, like in the case of nata de coco, so before, di ba, nata de coco, subuh of nata de coco, and they released these guides in coming up with a high quality nata de coco or coming up with a high quality product, okay? So, ano ko mayroong standards which are to be followed regarding production of fermented foods? Okay, so I guess uh, that will be enough for the Q&A. Uh, we will be uh, accommodating some of those. Uh, maybe uh, we can, uh, we have the copy of those questions and we can send uh, some answers to that. Uh, Tama ba, Noel, Doc Noel? Uh, is it possible to uh, share to them the questions? Yes, pa. yes, okay, pa. Okay, lang pa. But in, in the interest of time, uh, we are very thankful for uh, Dr. Noel uh, for this very wonderful. Uh, um, lecture. So uh, since there are no more questions, I mean, there are many questions, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, we will be cutting this short. Uh, so to show our gratitude uh, for the talk, uh, let me present to uh, uh, Dr. Noel, the Electronic Certificate of Recognition, signed by our director, Mariana P. De Leon. Let us now, uh, can we share, can we read this one? So you have here the Museum of National, Natural History. The certificate of uh, recognition is uh, uh, awarded to Dr. Noel G. Sabino in serving as resource speaker during the uh, 2021 MNH Balik Tanaw Kasaysayan at Kalikasan webinar series, Microbiology in the Philippine Cuisine, then and now. Uh, held on 28th uh, of July, 2021. Uh, it, in witness hereof is uh, Dr. Uh, Maria De Leon, our director. Thank you, Dr. Noel. Thank you very much, sir. All right, okay. So uh, let me now turn over to our MC for the closing. Doctor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Nelson Pampulina. So uh, now before we end this uh, very interesting webinar with uh, and medyo nakakagutong na topic, uh, and before you log out of the Zoom, uh, please allow me to uh, give uh, a few reminders. So please uh, 
uh, we are encouraging you to evaluate the seminar and this is for you to get a certificate of uh, participation. So the link is now uh, plus on the screen and uh, uh, copied in the chat box of Zoom in the comments area of our uh, YouTube live post. So you can uh, also use your mobile phones to scan the QR code shown in the slide. So please click on the link uh, provided uh, so that you will be able to give your uh, evaluation immediately. And uh, we will only accept uh, responses until uh, 3 p.m. today. So we are uh, so thankful for the uh, uh, following organizations and uh, people for all the support, resources, and uh, inspiration. So the uh, national, okay, so uh, you seen, you have seen that on the screen, okay. So finally, uh, with, uh, please uh, follow UPLB Museum on uh, social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and uh, Instagram. And uh, before we uh, uh, take a break and before you log out, uh, we are hoping to see you in our uh, next uh, seminar uh, entitled uh, Que es su nombre? Spanish Influence on Philippine Botany. And this will be delivered by uh, Professor Anali Hadsal and Miss uh, Michela San Pascual which will be on August 11, 2021. Uh, so be, uh, make sure you log out of the Zoom for security purposes. So finally, keep safe, everyone. Thank you. And